Hello everyone. Welcome to his author's voice and I am the author Jack Sanger. The complete story you're about to hear was written quite some time before Covid but its relevance is quite remarkable. It's set in present time and it posits a future which could easily happen. See what you think of it. The Begetters Get to the ice marsh. Run, run. Close eye, close ear. Night safe in water ice trees. Suck air. Run, run. Body dog skins. Our sweat wet hot. Our lost feet skins. Hand skins. Cold, cold there. Blood pouring hole in arm. Make weak. Mountain men closer. Fast running. Pointed stone sticks in air. Many followers throwing. Twist and drop head. Run, run. Body frightened. Fire burns inside. Make run quick. In front. Old trees. Small. Shadows in fog off ice water. Better ice snakes than hunters. Run, run. He was reflecting on events that had changed his cognizance of life as he drove into work on his last day. The city could not be more cosmopolitan. The dropping autumn sun cast an extra rosy glow across the faces of its inhabitants, somehow conferring an equality upon their disparate features. A warmth, a communal coziness. It had been a hard-fought global war to bring such peace and tranquillity not just of a weapon-led century of internal insurrections and state-against-state battles over resources, but of hearts and minds, of communality versus competition, of collaboration and trust versus selfishness and suspicion, of the secular versus the religious. Remarkably, the bigger picture had won out. Fusion energy, weather control... Food surpluses and disease eradication were international forces for good. A World Senate adhering to the principles laid down in the Hundred Articles provided a humane court of appeal to diffuse all conflicts. Well-fed, fear-free populations spoke their many tongues but focused their efforts on creation and play rather than destruction and meaningless work. Genetic engineering saw to it that all endemic or emerging sociopathologies had been firewalled. Through first trees, push across ice forest, cold, cold, dark unto water, wet thick air, no light moon, eye open, stay on top, run, side, run. Shouting hunters, so, no, near, breath, make body shake, watch ice break now, feel with toes for slip snakes, blade stone ready, scrape off ice suckers, slap air suckers, move, move, stay quiet, slow breath down, hunters, ears, good, island waiting, cave, fire, clan, kill hunters. Stop whole blood. It was the 53rd sample they'd worked on. There was no doubt. The microscope had picked up order. His assistant had yelled to him, We got something, Reuben! He'd looked down at it and then up at the blow-up on the screen. There... Amid the chaos of dead cells, the detritus in the bone graveyard of the long gone was a pattern, as certain as seaside light strung along a promenade. 
so tiny as to make you doubt your senses. But the electron mechanics were state of the art. They were flaring gently. They were saying there is a sequence here, complete enough to integrate, robust as tensile steel hawser to a tightrope artist. Repeated letters, a code, same but different. An algorithm waiting to be completed by synthetic characters like a closed sentence, the holy grail, modification of life. Hands and knees, no feel, only heat left in his chest deep, slow, up the steep slide ice, call, no sound from mouth, tongue big, throat rough sore, whole blood drops, big now, arm no good, cave no far, stop, roll on back, his tree with stone, Blade back, hit again, again, eyes shutting. Snow starts, ah, face no melted, fill ear, die now. He recalled what had led to this moment. It was just after he'd been made director. The familiar Russian voice on the phone. Am I speaking to Reuben Bloodson? You are. It's Grigoriev. I have something in a tank for you. In situ. Could be just what you've always wanted. Where? He had revealed the hope in his voice. Grigoriev knew his proclivities. North Pole, of course. Near as you can feel the ground under your feet. Kafkaluban Island? You know your geography. Coffee Club Island. It's symbolic. Well, the weather was a lot colder then, but we can have coffee round a campfire to remember their times, eh? Before the ice cap buries the place again. Grigoriev laughed and went on. Meet you up in Svalbard. A couple of weeks. I'll arrange your flight. Not dead. In cave. Deep in skins. Fire. Hot fat on lips. Beard. Fish juice. Back to dark. Sleep. More wake. More juice. Sea blood family. Mother feeds soup with bone spoon. Take off her. Feed. Not so weak. Try sit. No. Arm no good lift. One arm no fight. Go out hunters kill. Wood and fat burn last time. Blood family leave now. Mother. Woman. Too young. Hide from hunters. Me stay. Hunters find me. Go, waves hand. Make go, noise from mouth. Strike chest. Me die. Go, young. Find new tribe man, watch them. Not kill them. Make more with you. The sleek, light craft touched down on sleds, cutting its mini jets. Around the perimeter, antique planes were parked, icicles stretching from wings to ground, caging them, stalactites imprisoning an old world, flightless now. The edge of a new sun had begun its skim of the horizon. He switched on his electrothermals and got ready. At the bottom of the steps was Grigoriev. They hugged, feeling each other's muscles through the thin suits. A few hours from here, in an archaeo capsule, overland and frozen sea, said Grigoriev. We can talk on the way. They had lain side by side in comfort as the hover pod ate up the whistling snowy desert while Grigoriev brought him up to date. 
Chi Moon look down. Make light for hunters. Close now. No place. Smell fire. No one arm no good. Die. Ready. He son never come back. Hunters kill and throw to ice snakes. Eat all. Leave bones. Shut eyes. Wait. They had crouched in the lighted cave, looking into the see-through preserve tank with the bundle inside. The lid had a multi-level scanner. Reuben focused its lenses. He examined the body, section by section, from follicles of hair to the thick, heavy nails of its almost prehensile toes. Grigoriev had talked like a forensic detective. He's mummified, complete, wrapped in skins and layers of fat, frozen solid for 50,000 years, died from loss of blood. Arm injury, looks like this was home, evidence of fires, fish bones mainly, few stone tools, couple of wall etchings, sun, moon and stars, though it might be my projection, very indistinct. The whole lot has been under maybe 50 metres of ice most of that time. Our game, said Reuben, it was worth coming. Grigoriev had gone outside to organise the pickup of the tank while Reuben hunkered beside it. He took a look around him at the freezing glassy gallery of calcified drapes disappearing into the depths of the darkness. A wormhole in time. He closed his eyes. A vision came to him with shocking clarity, causing the blood to churn in his veins and a tremor to shake his bones. He saw the Neanderthal being attacked and badly wounded. He sensed his ancestor's pain as he crawled across the lake and up to the cave. He pictured the attackers. They were more like him than this injured ancient relative they were chasing. They had little facial hair. He could tell they were not just hunters, but seed planters, protecting their land against this warrior of an earlier age. The victim had been left to die by his kin. Ruin could sense that the Neanderthal was driven by biology. Protect the bloodline at all costs. He had sent them away. He wanted them to live on. He was facing death without fear or remorse. He would be taken up by the moon goddess. He was a calculating hunter of beasts and men, a warrior without compassion. He lived and died by the same rule, teeth and claw. A predator. Reuben felt his blood pound even more. The Neanderthal's psyche, rudimentary as it seemed, reached out across time and somehow spoke to him. Then he withdrew a little and saw the body from further away. Only one piece of evidence bucked his visionary understanding. Preserved between the fat-lined skins that covered him were the pressings of skeletal structures of plants. Purple saxifrage was covering him at the end. Reuben nodded to himself. This had not been Neanderthal work. The humans had done it. They had prepared him for the gods. Here was clear evidence of the gap between the two species. Sympathy for the dying. As he left the chamber of ice, he mused on what he'd found. An accidental combination of ice, fat, skins and plants had probably aided the process of mummification. Grigoriev's spot tests showed possibilities of recoverable DNA, which was partly why he was here. Sea hunters, sit round, watch him. Woman, look arm, take throat, hold in fingers, shake head, men nod. Make noises. 
No, understand. Talk, talk. Look to fire. The freeway gave way to a tree-lined avenue. Reuben accelerated past a couple of cars and swerved into it, making them break sharply and their passengers sit up, shocked, looking for the cause. He'd been headhunted for the directorship, his work on sequencing the genome. No one knew more than he did about the fabric of defence against viruses. What in the genome was human and what was Neanderthal? Conferred upon the species through occasionally aberrant mating and providing immunity against ancient pathogens. For two decades he had led the second phase of the global cleansing of the gene pool, washing out disease and malfunction. He'd got his Nobel Prize, his famed maverick qualities, his irascibility, his criticism of political uniformity were all woven into his bio-mythology. He was a media star precisely because he was rebellious and outspoken. Hunters making noise together, like wind, like rain, like bird, like animal. Up, down, up, down. Watch him. Slap hands. Noise together. At the end of the avenue were the gates with their guards. He stopped and they walked round the car. He may be the boss, but security was everything. The boot, the engine, the cabin, underneath the chassis. While they checked, his mind drifted. Around the time he was preparing his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize reception, a parcel had arrived for him. He couldn't remember when he'd last received a communication so primitive. It consisted of a large, ancient, stiff, yellow envelope with his name and the address of the lab, written in smudged nib ink. A strong adhesive had been used to fasten down the flap. Inside was a faded small town newspaper article from the time of newsprint. The small column headline read, Sterilisation goes ahead. Those affected. Underneath was a terse paragraph explaining the rationale for federal policy and a muted apology from the governor. Then there was a list of the people who had failed tests for healthy genes. On the list, and underlined, was a male name, Johannes Bergstrom. The cutting was dated before Reuben was born. There was also a scrawled note in the same mid-blue ink that addressed the envelope. He had trouble picking out the meaning. Handwriting was rarely used these days. Dear Reuben, I will be dead when you receive this from my solicitors. I felt it imperative for you to know that the parents who you think of as father and mother were not your flesh and blood, no matter how much you loved them, nor how much they obviously loved you. Your success in life must be owing to them, and for that I am truly grateful to them. Your dead father and I had long been lovers, even after I married. I lived in complete isolation with my husband, a forester, a kind man who hated the city and had no gene issues. He knew my love for you and supported my actions with grace and without bitterness. I paid your father what he termed a mercy visit as soon as he got wind that he was going to be on the next list. I didn't think twice. I could not agree with the policy, no matter what the long-term good for our species might be. His essence deserved to be carried forward. He was a noble man. 
we passed you on at birth to parents who had been genetically cleared and would never reveal your provenance. The authorities caught up with him in the end. His death was no accident, my son. It was the way they did things in those early days. World peace, whatever the cost. The irony of your work and fame is not lost on me. Your loving mother. That was all. No signature. He could have sourced the name of the town from the cutting and could have chased down an address. They might be half-siblings. But in the end, he hadn't thought it would add anything to his life to connect them. It was strange how it made sudden sense to him. His adoptive father and mother had always been mild, home-loving creatures. The family was a rose with no thorns until he came along. They were askance as he grew into adolescent belligerence and showed every sign of being an opponent of the establishment. Only his academic brilliance saw him unscathed through the turmoil he created. That package had changed everything. He had looked up Johannes Bergstrom. His father was the son of Finnish immigrants, one of the reasons he had gone to Kafkaluban Island. It was his genetic home of a sort. His actual father had been a rebel fighting for the exercise of freedom of choice in all matters an arch opponent of globalism, no matter how beneficial it purported to be. He was a political journalist who uncovered corruption in high places. He died in a motoring accident when the protective system in his car failed to operate and it careered into oncoming traffic, killing him, his wife and three passengers in other cars. Reuben had been deeply shaken by the discovery. It represented a seismic shift in his sense of place in the scheme of things. Faces. Watch. Bring flowers. Cover. Make pain go. Flowers on face. Arms. Legs. Doors leading into labs. Bio-crypto locks winking. Overhead concealed lighting casting soft shadows. Feet squeaking on the polished surface. His door sprung open for the last time upon a combination of iris, thumbprint and four-digit code. The office was almost clear now as he'd been removing his things for weeks. There was just one solitary box. With a sigh, he sat in his tailored-to-measure chair and leant back, shutting his eyes. After the arrival of the package, he'd done nothing to suggest he'd been affected by it. It was partly because he wanted time to reflect and partly because he didn't want surveillance to pick up changes in behaviour should anyone have an inkling of the contents. The discovery of the complete Neanderthal on the island and opened up the pathway that had lain dormant inside him. What he did next caused no internal conflict and was deceptively easy. A year passed. Then he published a paper following a discovery by scientists from China of a deadly ancient flu pathogen which had the capability of decimating the world's population. There was no current defence against it. He provided indisputable evidence that the Neanderthal's genes had a sequence which showed that the creature was immune to that pathogen. By tweaking the current human genome with the sequence, the flu, should it reoccur, would be rendered weak, if not helpless. So the tweak was added to the mandatory modifications required of all fertilised over worldwide. This would ensure there could be no 
pandemic. Last dark comes. Hunter woman, close face. Kiss, smile, say no die forever. Reuben picked up the box of his remaining possessions and made his way out of the building. Acquaintances nodded as he went past, unaware that they would not see him again. He set his car on override and headed off to the airport. He had flights booked to get him to Svalbard. After that, he didn't know. The introduction of the Neanderthals' gene sequence had gone well. Another line of defence against potential disease. It would be a long time before stats packages picked up the global increase in aggression among the young. By then it would be too late. The oldest would be young adults, calculating hunters of beasts and men, warriors without compassion. So if you like that story and you wish to read it, you can download it from my website at www.jacksanger.com where you can also find novels, plays and even some Zen non-fiction. I hope you do. But you can help me, of course, by sharing this story with your friends. The more the merrier. So that's all for now. Bye-bye.